Um, I'm Stephen Tepper. I'm Dean of the Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts at Arizona State University. And I want to welcome everybody to the ASU California Center. And this is one of our official launch events for ASU's new uh, building here in Los Angeles, the beautiful Herald Examiner building, a historic building here in LA. And uh, we're just thrilled to have so many of you in person. And I know we've got lots more online joining us. And so welcome everybody. Um, this uh, evening is about the changing face of museum leadership. Um, and you're going to meet some of those changing faces today. Uh, but it's more than just bringing new voices and new people into an old, uh, old system, an old institution. This is really about how new uh, faces are transforming what a museum is and what a museum can be. Um, tonight's event is a co-presentation of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and Arizona State University's Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts. And just a little bit about Herberger. Uh, it is the largest design and arts college in the United States, uh, comprehensive. We have about 8,000 students this fall with us. And uh, it includes the ASU Art Museum uh, and five, five schools. And now we have campuses based in Tempe, Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona, Mesa, Arizona, and now here in uh, Los Angeles. And in Los Angeles, we're here for a number of reasons. ASU is here because um, we have more than 15,000 students from California. So we should be here in California serving those students, advancing our mission of inclusion and excellence. Um, we're also here because this is the global creative capital of the world. And Arizona State University is in a state with the fifth largest city, Phoenix. And so we don't see geography and politi political borders as separating. We are part of a regional economy, and uh, we are delighted to advance our mission here. Many of you know by 2030, California will uh, not have seats for about 130,000 qualified college students. So that's another reason why Arizona State University is here in, in California. Um, I'm going to have to keep my finger on my screen here. Um, so this is a celebration of a partnership with the Los Angeles County Museum of Art that began uh, about five years ago. And it includes three elements, this partnership. It includes um, an academic partnership with James Terrell's Roden Crater, um, which LACMA has been very involved with, Michael Govan uh, in particular. And we're focused on interdisciplinary learning at this unbelievably epic uh, creative art object that is like none other in the world. And we're building uh, unbelievable learning around this, around this vision uh, from James Terrell. We're also doing collaborative exhibitions with the ASU Art Museum and commissions and, and sharing objects. And then this ASU LACMA Master's Fellowship in Art History, which you're going to hear about tonight. And uh, I don't want to say much about it because our panelists are going to talk about the, the fellowship, but more importantly about the future of museums. But basically, the conceit of this fellowship is that there is incredible talent that gets stuck in museum positions um, because people can't afford to leave their jobs in order to go get a graduate degree. And a graduate degree is often necessary to accelerate and advance your careers. And so we designed this specifically for staff of color who are working in a museum and who can get a degree for free at Arizona State University in, in our School of Art, which is a highly ranked program. Um, and by doing so, uh, they can accelerate their impact, their leadership in the museum field. We uh, began with, with fellows from the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And we've expanded now to include um, the Heard Museum in, uh, in Phoenix and the Perez Museum in Miami and the ASU Art Museum. And so we've, uh, we've seen, since 2018, four cohorts of fellows based across these four museums. We've graduated five fellows, three of whom will be with us tonight, matriculated another nine. And we are expanding this program to include other museums across the country. Um, the idea here, of course, is that we have great talent in our museums. And we need to invest in that talent and advance them so they can transform our museums of the future. And this program is proving to do that. And you're going to be inspired by what you hear tonight. Um, we have invited uh, 
as our moderator, Mel uh, Deborah Colin Morales of the Mellon Foundation. Uh, as many of you know, the Mellon Foundation has been um, a, a, a big proponent of diversifying uh, the museum sector, uh, a very important report in 2018 that helped shape our program, in fact. And so uh, Deborah Colin Morales has agreed to join us um, and moderate tonight's panel. And Deborah is program officer at the Mellon Foundation, but she's also served as executive director of the Bronx Museum of the Arts and director and chief curator at the Wallach Art Gallery at Columbia, director of curatorial programs at El Museo de Barrio, um, and uh, just a distinguished career, a real expert on, uh, on contemporary Latinx art, Caribbean, uh, African-American art, and so we're delighted to have Deborah. But before I introduce Deborah or bring her up to the, uh, to the podium, um, I want to just make some uh, acknowledgments. Um, uh, first, at LACMA, Michael Govan, who's going to be on our panel, CEO of the, and Wallace Annenberg, director of LACMA, uh, truly been a great partner and friend over the last five years. Um, when we think about the new American university as transforming and innovating education, I think Michael has done the same for how we imagine museums, and so there's a real sympathy uh, between our mission and vision and LACMA's mission and vision. Uh, Zoe Carr, Deputy Director at LACMA, who's been with us from the beginning and uh, amazing, uh, been an amazing partner. Uh, and Elizabeth Gerber, uh, Education Department at LACMA, who oversaw tonight's program. So Elizabeth, thank you for, uh, for putting this together. And then at ASU, we have Forrest Solis, who is the director of our School of Art, um, which is a partner in this fellowship program. Uh, Olga Viso, a senior advisor to the Dean for Global Art Partnerships and an advisor uh, to the LACMA ASU partnership. Angelica Afendor Pujol, who's the inaugural director of the fellowship program. And Cecilia Fajardo Hill, who's newly appointed director of the fellowship program. And then I want to introduce uh, Cheryl Boone Isaacs, who's in the back, who is our founding director of the Sydney Poitier New American Film School, which is one of the main reasons we're in Los Angeles is because we're building a film school like none other in the world that's going to be truly egalitarian and inclusive and operating the highest levels of excellence. And one of our homes for that school is here in the Herald Examiner building. And we're just delighted that Cheryl could join us uh, today. Um, and then finally, just to our partners, Franklin Sermons, director of the Perez Art Museum, who will also be joining us uh, on the panel uh, by, by Zoom, and uh, David Roche, who's director of the Herd Museum. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Deborah Colin Morales to the stage. And uh, you're, you're in for a big treat, big voices, big ideas about the future museums. Deborah, please join us. Good evening. So um, thank you, Dean Tepper. Um, I want to also just thank um, Olga and Elizabeth and everyone else who was involved in putting this evening together. Um, and thank you for inviting me to moderate this, this what's going to be, I think, a very interesting evening. Um, I'm going to do a brief, brief introductory remarks to sort of set the stage for what we're going to talk about. Um, and then I'll invite our panelists to the stage and we'll, we'll, get, we'll get rolling. So I just want, I'd like to get right into the heart of the conversation, and I'm going to reiterate a few things that Dean Tepper said. We're here tonight to discuss the changing face of museum leadership. For too long, this has been a necessary topic for our field, for too long. Um, in 2015, the Mellon Foundation issued its first museum demographic survey that gathered data and tracked the relative lack of diversity amongst museum staff. We knew this, but we needed the data to prove it and hold people accountable. The study revealed that, and I quote, although 28% of museum staff are from so-called minority backgrounds, the great majority of these workers are concentrated in security, facilities, finance, and human resource jobs. Among museum curators, conservators, educators, and leaders, only 4% are African American and only 3% Hispanic or Latinx, unquote. A second survey, a follow-up survey in 2018, 
showed slow progress, with, but with museum staff still not yet matching our census data. Our third iteration of this survey will come out in 2022. It'll be released very shortly this fall, I hope October. Um, but I can reveal to you tonight, in the cone of confidence, um, that we're still seeing what I'd call somewhat glacial progress um, since that first 2015 benchmark. In some areas, museum staffing demographics are beginning to approach US census levels. However, museum leadership and conservation continue to lag far behind. They are both fields that are 80% white. In the intercession between the second 2018 survey and today, we've also faced, as we all know, a global pandemic that's shown a bright spotlight on our societal inequities and a series of murders that sharpened our long-standing demands for racial equity and repair. Museums seen by some, some as colonial repositories that follow outdated Eurocentric and class-based models have lost a lot of public trust in this time. They've not always done a good job of protecting their staffs and providing increasingly inclusive workspaces in these times of financial duress. Some have been embroiled in repatriation issues, board affiliation donor controversies, and more. You've read about this in the newspaper. They've been seen as playing catch up while they work hard to evolve for the communities they serve and for whom they hold their collections. And yet we also all love museums, so we want to be optimistic. And there's also still many wonderful things happening in the field some of which we'll talk about a little later in the evening. I also want to let you know about another survey we're doing at Mellon, not to talk the whole time about surveys, but I think they're important and they intersect. We've paused to evaluate 10 years of a program that was called the Mellon Undergraduate Curatorial Fellowship, or MUCF. It's a terrible acronym, but that's what we call it for short. This fellowship, like, like the LACMA ASU Fellowship, program that we were talking about tonight, this also sought to expose underrepresented undergraduates to curatorial work by pairing them for two-year fellowships with one of our six great national encyclopedic museums, including LACMA. Like the ASU LACMA program, which aims to culturally diversify the leadership of art museums in the United States, MUCF began 10 years ago with the best of intentions to diversify the museum pipeline. We've paused to survey the field because we believe we now need to craft a theory of change framework that is, expands upon what were prior goals of mere compositional diversity. We need to examine the conditions, repetitions, and time necessary to enact real and sustained change. Because importantly, what does it mean if we're exposing a broader swath of people to the idea of working in our museums but as our own survey shows, they're not being hired. Are there no jobs for them? Do they decide to turn to other fields after their exposure? We need to understand this dynamic better and change it. Importantly, in the ASU LACMA program, fellows earn their master's degree in art history while they're already working in the museum. They don't have to leave, they have a job. And they're enabling, and the program is enabling the fellows to keep their job as they go to school. This disrupts also some of the systemic inequities that persist in higher education, a whole other topic that we could talk about tonight, um, ensuring, which ensures that only the privileged can gain degrees that pave the way to museum leadership roles. That's all being changed by this program, so it's a wonderful program. I do believe that all this ferment in the moment that we're in is a moment of real opportunity for museums to become the vital and relevant centers they could and should be. So at this point, I'm gonna ask my colleagues to please come join me on the stage, and we're gonna get into a, a conversation. I have to take this one with me. So let me, let me just introduce you again to our panel. Um, from left to right, we have Matthew Villar Mananda, 
a recent graduate and fellow and visual arts fellow at the Walker Art Center. We have Mickey Garcia, director of the Arizona State University Art Museum. We have Celia Yang, recent graduate and head of Directors Strategic Initiatives Asia and principal gift officer at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. We have Deandra Lawson, recent graduate and assistant curator at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And we have Michael Govan, CEO and Wallace Annenberg Director at Los Angeles County Museum of Art, who was already thanked and introduced. And I want to note we have a panelist on Zoom. <laughs> I don't know if we can, if we want to put Franklin on the screen to say hello. Is he I... on screen? There you are, Franklin. Okay, now everyone can see you. Cool, he's cool. A, so he's sorry, above us in larger than me. life. Franklin Sermons, <laughs> director at the Pettis Art Museum, Miami. Okay. So I'm going to kick off the conversation by asking one question of the panel. And then I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues here. The new changing face of museum leadership. Matt, Celia, and Deandra, Deandra to ask questions of Mickey, Michael, and Franklin. So my question, the first one, we'll, we'll, quote from, we'll note from a recent article that Amy Gil Gilman, the director of the Chazen Art Museum, wrote in, in Hyperallergic. She wrote an article, which you sh hopefully you all can look up, called The Era of the Visionary Museum Director is Over or Should Be. Amy Gilman wrote, the job should be less about fantastical visions and more about defining practical objectives for the entire institution and its constituents. The Harvard Business Review has also written an article, Why Visionary Leadership Fails. Very interesting. I recently, in my role as a program officer at the Mellon, had a museum director confide in me, when will just stabilizing the museum and making it a good place to work be the new sexy? So I will start by asking Mickey, Michael, and Franklin, you all face tremendous daily challenges and yet are also called up to provide the vision and the inspiration. How have you all experienced this tension between the visionary and the practical in your own institutions? Can you give us an example, perhaps? Who wants to start? Michael, you look like you have something to say. <laughs> You're looking at Franklin. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Oh, so, um, I I guess I feel strongly that that is the main job, right? You have to keep everybody taken care of and motivated to do hard work because you can't do anything by yourself if you're a director. Like, there's nothing you can do, powerless, <laughs> without. Um, the amazing team of people who are around. So a lot of it is, and this has been true in the last few years, is you know just keeping people motivated that there is a future. I mean, <laughs> keeping people employed during the pandemic was one of the highest goals that we had as a team. Um, and I do always say that, like that if we don't balance our budget, and so we have all these conversations, then there's not going to be any. Um, you know, what, uh, vision, I don't know what that word means in this context, but you know, there's not gonna be any opportunity to program in the way we wanna program. And, and I think it's particularly important if you wanna create very systemic change. Let's be honest, we have philanthropy as a big part of our business, and in a way, I always think in philanthropy, I'm in the trust business, and I have to create trust to have people give money to support our organization. And so that trust is based on things including balanced budget, people feeling well, but it's especially important if you want to, for example, tear down the old museum and build an entire new one in its place with a completely different methodology of curatorial practice. Don't try that unless you balance the budget. So I think <laughs> there's a little bit of both in that always, and, I, and, and I, I know everybody coalesced at LACMA all around when the pandemic hit to say, you know, let's most importantly keep everybody here, and it's also just strategic that if you do that, hopefully people are ready to work 
hard forward, it's, um, it's good for the place too. That certainly is an excellent example of practical and visionary at the same time, the new, the new museum building, yes. I'm not sure that I'm going to answer that question because it's so big. It, because I, I, that question around what an executive is supposed to know and is supposed to be something that like people are going to invest in and follow in all, you know, in times of in great times, but also in times like COVID, and it, it's it's a lot. I mean, I personally have had executive coaching I, almost all throughout my career, and I've learned how to build a team that really can do the things that I can't do. But I think that in terms of vision. For some of us, and I would say a lot of the directors in this room and my colleagues here, it, the vision, it's so purposeful. I think of my, my, my draw, I've been drawn to museums as a calling. It's a vocation almost. And so when I think about uh, walking into the museum and thinking about what it could be, you know, I have such a personal story and how the arts have changed my entire family's life, how um, how it has been so important for my own identity and thinking about who I am in this world, and that was all shaped by going to museums, that I know, and uh, because I truly lived the, and experienced the transformation of what arts can do to a person's life. So I take that everywhere, and that's the lens I bring. Um, but the, the daily, the, you know, that sort of like balancing the budget, Absolutely, I think that one of the things that we think about when we we're gonna talk about here tonight is just how we can think of ourselves at, in the museum as not these like temples and structures and sorry, Michael, I know you've got a big temple and a structure <laughs> you're building right now, but really as, as, a, as a group of humans who are also probably drawn because you know, we're, or else you know, we'd be in the private sector, we're also all drawn to this work and so kind of budding and cultivating that that kind of um, purpose in them really is I think what what makes it possible to do those kind of practicalities but it's a bit it's a big that sort of macro micro I was just telling uh, uh, one of my staff members I was like I, I went from a 10-year visioning meeting to uh, we have you know a, a gap in our schedule you know that was like one meeting to the next and that's just how it is but Thank you, yeah, and I mean, looking at some of all the negative information that I provided up front and then meeting, you know, this morning I had the privilege of meeting with a number of the um, current and previous um, fellows in the program and it's so inspiring to hear how, how they all are drawn to the work and you all are drawn to the work and you're gonna talk about that shortly. Let's, um, let's, see, if, let's see if Franklin yeah. has anything to add, Franklin. Hey, Bev, hey, everybody. So sorry not to be there, but happy to be here, at least virtually. Um, I, you know, I, I think that statement is, is interesting in that those things kind of run parallel. I mean, without vision, without being visionary, um, we don't put ourselves in positions to lead. I mean, I know I wouldn't be in this position if I didn't work for someone who was such an incredible visionary. Um, and I think that's what allows for us to do what we do, which of course is got to be practical as, as both Vicki and Michael have touched upon is that there are certain things that absolutely have to be done in order to be visionary. And part of that is being practical. I mean, for us personally, uh, the experience here, especially around COVID was that, you know, we were able to, I think, dig in deeply to some of the issues that are so dear to us all that we're gonna hear about a little bit more this evening um, because of the practical things that we did in order to make sure we were taking care of our staff and creating, I think, bridges between staff and board at such a pivotal time. And that's what allows us to be visionary. So I find the statement kind of, you know, tricky. Well, thank you. Um, that's, it, it certainly is tricky, and yet you're all somehow managing to balance that between the practical, the daily, and, and, and the big ideas, um, for which we're grateful. Um, let's, let's turn now to our colleagues and recent graduates of um, the ASU LACMA Master's Fellowship in Art History. Um, I'm gonna start with Matthew, um, who will begin by asking our museum directors assembled here about their caring for their staff and their publics. 
Well, I wrote a really long question, so feel free <laughs> to answer any part of it. But um, there was an article in 2019 published by Gretchen Jennings, Jim Cullen, and Janine Bryant et al. And they argue that a rigorous assessment and treatment of empathy applied across the institution, everywhere from its civic engagement to its institutional work culture and its performance measures, they can serve as trans a transforming force for museums. And um, as I find myself deeper and deeper in this world, I always keep uh, another scholar really close to my heart, which is Amy Lone Tree. And in her book, she writes that museums can, quote, cease to function as places for perpetuating colonizers serving images and models by promoting, quote, healing, revitalization, and national building for indigenous peoples. So how have museums recognized this responsibility? I can start with Mickey since we <laughs> have worked really closely together at the ASU Art Museum and yes, we're on campus. <laughs> so great to see you, Matt. We're gonna celebrate Undoing Time, which we curated together this week at the, Ber at the Berkeley Art Museum, so excited. Um, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a big question, and I think, I think about it two ways. There's empathy for our staffs and the people who work um, in the museums, but then there's the empathy of the, inst the, the idea of an institution, like a museum institution being an empathetic organism or a civic structure. And you know, at, at the museum and in uh, the work that we did in Undoing Time, we, we talked a lot about abolition and we talked about people over property. And w you know, we, I brought that into the museum in terms of a, a lens, like what if museums really designed themselves to, to put people over buildings and property and con you know that sort of thing, that, that all of the objects that we show or the artists that we champion are in the service of people, people's connections, people's stories, that that's really the main thing that we do that's magical or compelling. And I think that you know uh, when when I think about a museum in that frame, in that lens, it, it leads me to think about a museum in, in it in right relationship to the communities that it sits in or it serves. And the way I think about a hospital or a, a school or um, you know a, a courthouse, let's say, a, any kind of civic institution, it allows for people in and out. It's changed by the demographics. It it um, you know, I, the definition of a, a, a colonizer is that it goes into a space and that space gets transformed, but this, but we remain largely not transformed. And that's kind of the setup that we have when we invite people into our museums. We expect them to be transformed, but we remain not transformed. And so to think about what an empathetic lens might be like um, as, a, as a design principle, um, of course, the first, the first part of the DNA of that would be how we treat our staff. I mean, me personally, Matt, it's really hard. I have a much smaller staff than Michael does or Franklin does, and how we care for a smaller staff is really different than the scale that Michael would have, have to think about. There's so many different kinds of museums, too. But I definitely think that um, when we can think about ourselves as these institutions that are in right relationship with, with civic engagement, then we really, the everything starts to change. Um, yeah, I think I'm gonna leave it at that. What do you, what do you think? I mean, how do you, you've, had, you've now been in a three different museums at least? Yeah, it has been, well, I start at the store, so I feel like uh -huh. at, at LACMA. LACMA. So I have a connection <laughs> there. But I think that what was really notable is that uh, many times institutions uh, choose as their mission to champion artists, art museums, champion artists, promote artist practices. Um, and the deeper you go down into the frontline level, you'll find artists and students and diversity and people of color. Um, but we're also the most precarious. I will, we were you know, concerned about, you know, sometimes I was using credit cards to buy meals or sometimes I was just trying to find a therapist. Sometimes. Um, those things were really divorced from the types of services that an empathetic institution would offer, um, or maybe like, you know, or a museum would offer, that's what I mean. So I was thinking, you know, um, 
can a museum be a space where I learn the language that my mother taught me? Can it be a space where I can find a place to find the monkeypox vaccine? You know? <laughs> um, and it's, it's, um, it is, as a civic institution, like a library or a community center, um, I feel like the artists are really embroiled in these grassroots politics. Um, and they work it into their aesthetics and the content of their artworks. But um, I think that having the platform and the space to um, materialize those things would be amazing. <laughs> I, 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 Hello. OK, great. Um, yeah, uh, Matt, you mentioned artists. And when you said empathy, too, I sort of immediately thought of them. <laughs> because um, they're the ones I see who are, I think ep empathy entails response um, and understanding. And I think that's so often what artists are doing is they're looking around and responding to their environment and what they see. And I think the more often that museums can be like artists, <laughs> respond, and use the platform that they have for sort of empathetic work. Um, yeah. Does anybody else want to say anything about this? Um, I think it's really nice what Mickey was saying about it seems dumb and simple, but it should be repeated. <laughs> if you just re-index things towards people first, and then you have to think about all the different people and what places they hold. But just as a way to think about it, that's just, museums don't always do that, right? So that's just a nice way to put it, and it seems like a nice system of thought to do that. <coughs> um, I think the idea of changing museums towards, Matthew, what you're talking about is, is can be sometimes easier said than done because of the structure of it, the, you know, that we can live in a bubble. And so I'm constantly thinking if the goal is, and it was always my goal, is always systemic change. How can you change norms? like? Sometimes it's more fun to work in a small museum, which I did, and everybody has the same reading list, and you're all on the same page about everything, but you don't have the reach to change norms. And so I'm always thinking about strategies to change norms and to change thinking. And um, it's really interesting that like, that you've all been and know the plaza at LACMA is sort of like open. You can walk your dog up to the ticket booth, and that wasn't the plan, <laughs> actually, originally. But there's this idea that if you have to hold the door and open it, that's a decision, that's a big decision, and the museum is a, has a barrier. And so I think there's a lot of things, even in terms of environment, to change, to, to blur the line. And I always wanted it to be like LA's living room, just blur the line. Everybody can walk there. They can be there for free. They can sit down. They can talk to each other. So hopefully that. And then it's a lot of work to get the museum to think about working outside its, you know, safe space. So a lot of things we will do may be maybe not as successful in terms of numbers of people, but they might be uh, in terms of thought process, like uh, Charles White Elementary School, which is the only elementary school with a professional art gallery in it. John just worked on shows there. But <laughs> the idea of getting the museum to think about that, and for example, even <laughs> having to negotiate with the content with the school and like you don't make all the decisions, that itself is a learning experience that hopefully should create more empathy in your practice. And then thinking about then we can take that to exist and have our programs as we do in other neighborhoods and other places with different thinking. I think Diana Magaloni is in our audience, so there you are. Um, if you go to the exhibition we have now uh, on uh, ancient Colombia, I mean, Diana's point in that was to reach out to uh, indigenous leaders, <laughs> an indigenous leader in a community there to give us guidance on how to approach things. And so museums don't usually think that way, like, okay, we're going to ask somebody else for advice on what to do and all of that. So I guess to make those changes that you're asking for, uh, it is, again, like most things, easier said than done. You have to find, I think, practical um, excuses, situations, experiences to cause the change of thinking physically and otherwise. So I think that's sometimes the hardest thing is to just get the thought process to change. But I like, I love what you're just saying, Mick. If you just go through that in your mind experiment through everything you're thinking about, you'll probably come up with some better answers. So thank you. Yeah, it's a fantastic exhibition. I just want to point out a portable universe. I think it's only up for a couple more weeks. So please see it. It's I hear a lot of people say co-designed, but this really is. So um, it's not just the term. It's actually really co-designed, yeah, co-prepared. So. 
Franklin, did you want to jump in? I just want to be conscious because you're on Zoom and make sure to include you in this conversation. No, no, thank you. I mean, I, I think we're all um, you know, trying to get to this point um, where it's a, a decision between what can we do in terms of societal response and civic response. Um, I think Mickey hit it on the, on the head. And, uh, and again, I think about that relationship to COVID because these are things that we were talking about prior to that but um, needed to really um, get motivated behind and have an initiative that was not supported um, prior to COVID. I know for us, I mean, one of the things that we missed the most about um, that period was not being able to use art in the service um, of people. Um, this idea that we, you know, we have a program called in the in the neighborhood pam in the neighborhood and and obviously not being able to have that kind of hands-on experience took us away from some of these inclinations towards empathy that we've had to work really hard to um to return to right now so just trying to to make that um an integral part of of what the museum can be as a civic entity thank you let's let's turn oh Celia, sorry did you want to say something oh no i was just Please want to say that um, I think museums have been a space of empathy for the hardships that have been happening in the last few years. Um, a lot of artists have put together works about healing and that is a big part of you know civic engagement and bringing the community together to heal together and to have an open and safe space to talk about what has been challenging and um, I think Museums can further do that, of course, but you know, shows, exhibitions, public programming, those are the spaces in which we can all heal together and be empathetic of the challenges that we face together. Thank you. Um, well, let's, let's turn now to Deandra. I know she's been thinking about new models for our institutions. Um, thank you. I think empathy is actually a nice segue um, for my question, which has to do with collaboration. Um, ASU and LACMA partnered <laughs> to create these amazing fellowships and opportunities. And um, as I look across curatorial practice, um, it seems to me that um, collaboration has become a really urgent uh, methodology and philosophy um, to sort of challenge traditional infrastructures and even the narrative of um, art history. Um, so I'll start with Michael, but certainly open to all. Um, how, how do we adopt collaboration as a methodology to sort of um, to transform the 21st century art museum? Um. Well, you know a little bit because we often talk about this at LACMA, but uh, one of my themes is like how many holes can we poke in the surface? How, how much more permeable can we make that membrane? And then again, it's down to the pragmatics of how you really do that. Where's Cheryl Boone Isaacs who's here somewhere? She was, she was in the old May Company building when we were hatching together how the two of us would collaborate, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences and LACMA to create a art and film center, a very different feeling place in the center of Los Angeles. So, in, But institutional collaboration is hard, and you know, we, we own works together with almost every institution in Los Angeles as a way to keep ties. We have an agreement with the Autry Museum to treat our collections as one, like that, that they're one. Why should we all be collecting things individually? So I think there's the institutional collaboration, and then there's the this sort of within institution collaboration that we work very hard on. Everyone knows I would run LACMA more like a kibbutz and everybody would be collaborating and working. There would be no <laughs> hierarchies and no titles, but maybe we can't do that right away. But, um, but we did, so here's just an interesting practical thing. When we were thinking about how do you reimagine the art history in a completely new circumstance of a building that's designed to be non-hierarchical and ever-changing. So points of view continually shifting, artwork shifting, and no hierarchy or set boundaries of colonial boundaries, I would call them. And um, there's this thing where you think, 
oh, and it's going to be collaborative, and everybody's going to work across departments and across generations, and it's going to be so exciting. And, and then you think, oh, but you know the best proposal is probably just going to come in from one curator, and the whole thing's going to come apart. But as this team knows, some of them, we put out the calls. We got 320 proposals. I forget how many who came in on this. And we all agreed that the best ones were 99% ones that were collaborative across departments and ex expertise and age groups in terms of age of education, right? And uh, it was a thrilling moment <laughs> when they all came back. So I just want to advertise that collaboration really works and I think creates a better work product, um, a better opportunity, more access to resources, all the traditional things that we want to say are the metrics. And so I just think it's an underutilized uh, tool. And then there are all the great side benefits of it, which is people working together and sharing ideas. But it, it's a main strategy, not a secondary strategy. I w yeah, what a great question. Um, and yes, I mean, I, I think that just Matt and I our show, I think, is one of the best because there were four of us in all different generations See? and et cetera. But <laughs> proof. There you go, proof. But I, I think, and we, and we all learn so much, but I think that, um, you know, at sp sitting up here, I'm a director, but I was a former curator. And I now, when, when I moved to ASU, I heard this statistic, you know, so we're at this university talking about graduation rates, et cetera. And I heard a statistic, I think it was from the dean, you know, something like 70% of all Arizonans don't have a college degree. And I thought, I looked around my, my staff, and all of my staff has a college degree, every single one of them. Already, like I could collaborate with my staff, and we are maybe not speaking on behalf of the Arizonans, um, which is, this is the state university whose collection we steward on behalf of the people of Arizona. Uh, so to me, you know, what I, I take really seriously, this idea of collaboration with people who have different forms of expertise, um, particularly in the, in the curatorial realm, because, you know, as I observe educational programs or curatorial programs, and they all strive to be really c collaborative, but really the internal mechanics and process in most curatorial um, meetings for an, what gets put on an exhibition schedule happens internally with internal um, staff members who are, most of us are privileged. We live in urban cities. A lot of us are able-bodied. You know, we all have higher education. We're, we're speaking all in a cul-de-sac of information, which is all expert information, but not all the information. And in that, in that regard, I think of course no one's, you know, of course we have people not applying to our programs, or of course large percentages of audiences to museums are white, because we don't really validate in the decision making at the very top these different forms of expertise. And we do become gatekeepers in that regard, because we're not seeing that. With our curators, they, every single curator has to work with a community of practice. These are communities of experts. They also now, we have been working through a series of retreats to kind of break open the curatorial um, decision-making process so that they have to propose exhibitions to a community of advisors and staff um, and then get vetted and then it goes to curatorial for being put on the schedule. So there are all these kinds of models that we're trying to break open in terms of like, what does it really mean to collaborate with people, not just bring our resources to bear on a place, which I've done so often, but really to, in and not to extract either from a place, which museums often can do, but to really be in this, this relationship that is truly collaborative where um, we're recognizing different forms of understanding of creativity, creative expression. So I think that's what we're doing at the museum. Fantastic. Franklin, would you like to chime in yeah. on collaboration? Yeah, I would just add from here. I mean, I think it's it's an interesting vantage point that we're working from in that, you know, we are the larger institution um, within Miami dedicated to the arts. And, and I think what we've what we've discussed a lot and, and still are trying to implement at, at greater scale is our ability to partner with other nonprofits and other 
smaller organizations that don't have the same presentational platform that we have and to co-present um, film or dance or music or art in, in ways in which it's about bringing together um, separate entities. It also is a way of bringing other people into uh, the museum space, uh, obviously that might not already have that kind of link. So I'm really trying to stress this idea of, of collaboration right now as a means of not only extending the reach of the museum, but providing a platform for valuable institutions um, that don't have the, the presence that we have in the community. So I think it goes so much towards from an artistic point of view and working with um, artists and working with curators, um, but trying to put ourselves a little bit outside of uh, that frame and working with organizations that do some of the things that as empathic institutions we might consider to be valuable. Thank you. Would anyone else like to add anything to this conversation or we'll move to the next question? No? Okay. So we have a, we have a question from Celia. We're moving from taking care of our staffs to collaborations in the institution, amongst institutions. Now we have to get to the really important part of the matter about boards and fundraising, right? So <laughs> Celia, would you like to, to ask your question? Sure. Um, so according to AMD and Board Source, 80% of nonprofit boards are white and 25% of boards are 100% white. Additionally, we know that nonprofits and museums in general have a tough time attracting new donors and tend to fall back on tried and true fundraising methods, often relying on exclusivity. This leads to a very undiversified donor base. So two questions. How are you diversifying board leadership and how do you see fundraising models change to incorporate um, inclusivity? So Franklin, I'm gonna throw it to you first. Thanks, uh, yeah, good to see you. Um, you know, I, I think it's worth saying here I mean, within the, the, the context of this discussion that we, we began in, as a museum, um, as the Center for Fine Arts in the early 80s in Miami, right? So literally um, two years after Mario Boatlift, which has, in addition to things like Operation Peter Pan in 1962, really drastically changed the demographics of this place. So we kind of came out of that environment and then in the mid 90s um, became a collecting institution with a somewhat muted but stated commitment to reflecting the increased diversity uh, of Miami at that time. And what we have sought to do in the last five years is really just lean into that as mission and vision. And that has meant keeping a uh, eye on the diversity of the board as much as it relates to the diversity of the staff, setting um, goals to be reflective of the actual uh, city and county of Miami. And we use those um, on an annual or, or regular basis as a means of measuring uh, our effectiveness um, in those goals. And I think like so many things, I mean, I still feel like this context, and maybe it's because I'm on Zoom, but. The, the, the context of coming out of the last couple of years of COVID, but also of the kind of renewed uh, emphasis upon uh, civil rights, upon human rights, a lot of it spurred forward by the work of BLM, um, has been that everybody has had a chance to really renew the focus on these very important things. I think that goes hand in hand with diversifying uh, the board is also part of making it a reflection of staff and making it a reflection of community. What it has also allowed us to do is to see the different ways in which people participate in philanthropy. Um, and I think that that kind of diversity of experience is what opens us up to new streams of funding and to thinking about fundraising in many different ways. Appreciate that, Celia. Mickey, well, I, I can sit from a privileged perch because I don't have a board. <laughs> I have a, an amazing advisory board and an incredible boss. So um, I, I can talk about this more from an observation than actually every day in practice. I mean, I think, but, but, but the notion of diversity of the board always, I just always wince because um, 
Be, well, well, I personally, I'll just give where I'm coming from positionally is that, you know, I will be, uh, I will have been a, a worker at museums and someone will say, oh, we hired a Latin American, you know, we got a Latin American on the board. Well, I'm a U.S. born, fifth generation Chicana, you know, Latina. That is really different from a very wealthy Venezuelan getting on a board. Um, you know, it, it, who, who has that, it, it's just, there's not a lot of understanding. Um, and so to just fill a seat with a diverse person I, I, is really problematic to me. Um, what I'd like to see is the board reflective of the community it serves. So if you are in Queens or if you're in, in the Bronx that you have, you know, Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, you have, you know, now Mexicans, I guess, but if you're in LA, you have the people that are the here and that are the people that are really coming and paying taxes into um, the museum that you, that you're, that we're running. Um, I think that's a more nuanced understanding of who needs to be at the, who is the owner. So we can, because I also think we're talking about economics too, we can have a lot of, um, people who are diverse and check that box, but if they are all at the same country club, then are they really speaking for the communities that we're trying to serve by having their representation on that board? I don't think so. So I, it really has to be more nuanced than that. And, and so I often am just like, ah, diversity on boards, that's the wrong question in a lot of ways. Because it's really about, do your boards represent the zip codes, the people, the migration histories, the economic histories, the diasporas, as Frank was, was saying, of the people in your region. Those are, I think, better questions. But I think that when it comes to tr transformation of philanthropy, it's a both and. We, we need boards, we need people who have resources, we need philanthropy, and a as an ASU, I mean, we're sitting at a place that was just voted number eight, I'm gonna get a bonus this year. I'm just kidding. That was not eight years in a row is um, voted the most innovative institution in the country because it's a both and situation at ASU. Of course, we rely on funding streams that are traditional, but we also scale and we also do online education. We have a hundred thousand learners. We changed our charter to be more inclusive, and those are the kinds of things that inc that in attract peop more investors. And, the, and I guess this is around crowdfunding, but I do think that sometimes boards are really risk averse because they own the institution and directors serve at the pleasure of the board. And that those kind of dynamics make for a really risk averse kind of situation that keeps us in the same kind of classical funding models. So collaboration, I think, um, piloting, funding, <laughs> for those pilots. I think those are all the things that are gonna get us through, but the more people we have invested, the more, um, I think, financially sustainable museums can be. It's just a real, it's a real risk to walk away, I think. What do you think, Celia? No, definitely. I was gonna ask, what, what does Celia think? Yeah, she's, Celia think? She's the one church with, uh, tasked with uh, working together with a lot of us to, to go down that path. I mean, it's a hard thing, too, because, I mean, we talk about this a lot because, you know, we've transformed our nonprofits into s relying so deeply for the salaries that are going to care for our staffs on private philanthropy. I mean, just to put the stress level in perspective, I think I figured out one day that it's like I have to raise $1.7 million a week, like from the day you start. And you, it's terrifying sometimes because <laughs> otherwise you know everybody can't everybody needs to work and they, that you're it's a lot of people to take care of so you have this stress of the fundraising and then of course we do need to reflect the communities I mean it's a little different in a giant international museum because obviously we have artworks and artists that are part of our constituencies that come from around the globe and to have global representation is also part of our mission so we're working on that um, but it is a complicated thing, especially, I mean, the good news in part is that in a lot of American institutions, we've pushed a lot of the decision making to the staffs and executive leaders. And so hopefully, I remember once in a panel, somebody said, well, we really have to wait until the board, you know, this whole diversity question and everything else. So we really have to wait for the board and for them to get their act together and then guide us. I was like, no, you don't. You just do what you're going to do. 
and um, you know they'll come along. And I, I, I am a little bit of advocate of the reverse transformation. If the programs are super diverse, if the staff can be much more of that, you really don't have any choice because who else would be interested <laughs> in your program unless they share the same values. But actually, I think it is, I'm sorry to do this, but to throw it back on Celia, she's been literally on the front lines of these questions talking with individuals, if, as I have, about all these questions and trying to get people sometimes who don't even want to be involved in the museum because what do they need a museum for? I mean, there was a famous quotation some point ago about um, these big institutions that purport to be general institutions versus specialized institutions like the Studio Museum or Museo del Barrio, and somebody said, well, they are for specialized, they're just like big museums for white people. And they are specialized in that sense because they have such a, you know, a problematic history on that level. But, um, but I, and I think that's why a lot of people shy away from them, right? Like as stewards and so we have to make ourselves worthy of those stewards and we have to make people interested in investing in that concept at the same time. It's not just, you said it again perfectly, as you always do, but it's not, it's both, right? And, and Celia, I think you should say a little about being on the front lines of this process of trying to do both, right? Yeah, I mean, Mickey, definitely agree with your point about the board reflecting the community, and often that really is not the case. Um, Los Angeles is made up of a melting pot of different cultures, and I have to say, like, a lot of the boards on um, the museums in Los Angeles are not diverse and don't reflect the community that they serve. Uh, and I think a part of it is about trust building, of course, with the community itself. Um, and you brought up a really good point about grassroots support. And a lot of museums shy away from that because it's, a, it's hard work. You know, it's a little, it's slightly easier to raise a lot more money from one person than it is to raise pennies from a huge collective. But I'm, I don't want to bring it to politics. Bernie Sanders did it, you know? Like, he is a perfect example. I think it's about being um, confident and trying new things, as you said, not being risk averse. And that's hard because there are mouths to free feed, like you said, Michael. So um, I think a part of it is trust building, but a part of it also is about not being afraid to go into different communities. You know, a lot of development officers, they tend to stay within the same country club and, you know, um, solicit within the same communities. And it's about providing that outreach and that confidence to go out there and um, also hiring diverse um, development officers, you know, who represent those communities that you want to target. Because I have to say, meeting a lot of my colleagues a lot of them are white, and so, of course, there's going to be a lot of white donors because they understand that language and, um, you know, that those behaviors. So I think it's building out and also building within will really help bring new voices to the table. Yeah, I think, th and there's a belief, I mean, I deeply believe that the most diverse board in all levels, not just community as well, will be the highest performing, even in fundraising, but that is systemic change. Like we're talking serious systemic change and you don't start always, I mean we are trying to diversify our board and do some of that, but you have to work at different levels. I mean we're trying to work like let's get exhibition donors who are giving 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, let's have more names involved, let's see if we can do that. So it's a, it's a multi-tiered thing and I think it's, it, it does sort of define systemic change given that all this energy has been built up for almost the opposite in recent years. But it will perform better. I we think we have an seen exhibition, that, right? and the curator is sitting in the room, and we're doing multi-level marketing for it. We're actually asking people to host different, you know, um, different like events for the exhibition, and then they host other events and that sort of thing. That's a lot. It's a lot different approach, and it's a lot more work. But we have to seed it, I guess, is take a percentage of our day for those kinds of long-term systemic changes. But. I was just going to add, I mean, if, if that's, you know, where we come from, I think all of us in terms of museums and, and a belief that there is, is value, uh, as Michael touched on, in terms of diversity and knowing that the Museum of the Future 
is built upon uh, the ability to transform its itself in terms of diversity. And it is simply good, good business uh, for us to, to further that change. Um, it kind of reminds me of these interesting conversations about um, ESG not being uh, a, a good way of, of being an investor. And, and if you think of the future of the planet and many other things, that it would only um, seem to serve us as, as a barometer of how uh, to be a successful investor in that sense in the future. And, and of course, I speak from a state in which um, ESG is being uh, tested to the point of, of we don't believe in it, right? So we don't think that that is good business because it means that you're taking into account people uh, rather than um, property, to go back to, to Mickey's point. So I think we are in this incredibly good position where we can further um, those kind of ideals. Yeah, it is tr it's a lot of trust building though to go back to that theme. And so, um, and it goes even back to the first question about practical things. If you can't, I mean, we often can note that a, a more diverse program is gonna, does actually, and we have the numbers to prove it, bring a lot more people, therefore hopefully more revenues and support and so, people who are in, you build trust to people who want to support that and make it clear that that's the goal and it will be the most successful and just like investing, I think that could be the most successful too because it's gonna, it's the zeitgeist of the future and we just need to get there faster. Deandre, oh. I just wanted, <laughs> Deandre, I wanted to ask you, but Deandre go first and then Matthew. Um, I, I just wanted to add too, sort of um, back to this idea of um, you know, I've asked myself too, like what are the sort of alternative fundraising strategies for the future? Um, can we consistently rely on individual support? And Mickey, I think you again said it right. It's the both and situation and the more that we can collaborate, I think the more that museums um, can leverage their resources to make major acquisitions possible or major shows possible, um, whether that be financial resources or space or, or whatnot, um, potentially, um, the less we have to rely on um, fundraising strategies that are sort of, as you put, Celia, sort of the pennies from, <laughs> from the masses or, you know, these individual contributions, but like big gifts or big partnerships that make um, really substantive change. Thanks. I was just going to add that um, starting at museums, I always had no idea what my relationship to the board was. They have, they're kind of mythologized as being very powerful, but, um, but I had no, you know, understanding of how they might impact like my material uh, reality. But I, I think that what's, uh, my conception of what a board might be is that not only are they, you know, providing like fiscal oversight, but they are tasked with the, um, like cultural ambassadorship. And if they're an cultural amba ambassador, then they should reflect, you know, people that I put my trust in, people who are fighting for the services that, you know, our communities might need. Um, so I just, um, I just, I, I think that when if I was starting in a museum as an artist or a writer, it would be amazing to imagine what it would look like if, you know, a board would do, a, a board member does a studio visit with within its staff rather than an artist that they're um, soliciting. Um, or that they're partnering with an institution that you know has made a huge amount of change within um, my community, but there's someone who um, uh, is on the board that reflects that. So I, uh, yeah, just wanted to add that. <laughs> that's great. And to, so to Deandre's point, I just want to add that, like, that's actually the sixty-four million dollar question from my perspective: is what is the new? Is there a new model to be made for creating the budget for the museum? Like. So I think your generation is going to be the yeah. one to solve so that. That's, that's kind of the point of the ASU program and all these <laughs> right. programs that we're invested in, right, as right. Mellon and museums and trying to do this because, yeah, that's the, I mean, one of the things that's important about this ASU program, I just want to say, is that so t to get to those positions where you're making the decisions on how to implement that or maybe take the risks that we take, there's a lot of things that have to happen because you do have to have a degree, actually, to be in the position of power to make those decisions. Um, it's also, there's something about having enough experience and starting 
young enough to be able to do that. And that's where the, just to say this ASU program is like sometimes people have to leave the museum world to go do their, get their degree or the opposite, they postpone working. And so part of that is to get the next gen, this generation, the next generation into those positions to try all those things. And so that goes back to this fundamental thing. If we don't actually develop a lot of means to create pathways to the new leadership and to those things, you know, we will never get there. So I think it comes down to like the practical thing again, <laughs> is how do we get people in those positions well, to, uh, to get that done? <laughs> and I would, I would say to Deb, it, you know, when we're talking about this big new question, you know, um, we, ha we haven't mentioned the word accountability at all mm -hmm. um, on the stage. And I think that young people have held us accountable. It's this generation, your generation, that has been the generation to jump on social media or um, unite or you know union, whatever it is, they, they're collectively working to demand, make demands of museums that my generation didn't do as, as much. And I think that when we think about boards, we think about the financial accountability that we have to the IRS, to you know maintaining budgets. But it's still in my observation when, it, you know, when I'm sitting in a room full of museum directors or curators and they will say like, oh, we showed this black artist. Shouldn't I have a gold star for that? You know, oh, we showed this or we did this program as though everyone is supposed to sort of applaud them for being such good EDIers, you know? And I, I would love to see as much fiscal responsibility, I mean, accountability that boards have that we would have that accountability to boards and museums for representation, for empathy, for all these other things, and that it wasn't just like a do-gooder, you know, like, oh, we're so good, and that, and also, I mean, we're also working in isolation, so what you're doing, what Franklin is doing, we're all these silos. Um, but these are the kind of, the questions is when, we, when we're thinking about who is holding us accountable, it's not our, our generation and our colleagues. Right, right. And I think what you're getting at is that, um, like diversity is not enough. The board has to be interested, like in our, in our survival, like as a community that we're bound within it. And even though someone that looks like me may be on the board, they might not be for that survival. But I always thought that you know museums, um, by collecting and showing artworks and um, and kind of generating giving circles, are like vehicles for resource distribution. But um, uh, so I would like to see how that pathway looks like. Right, I think like things like mutual aid and those kinds of things museums sometimes can't do because of the restrictions, so. I wonder how we're doing on time. We have five minutes left and I wanna, I wanna make sure that we give a minute to let the audience ask any questions of this fiery panel of exciting ideas. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Um, so just to follow up on the last uh, question about board members, um, why does one need to be on the board to influence the decisions within a museum? You know, the purchases and how the money is spent. And, you know, I mean, can you maybe extract the power to some degree or disentangle it from the money? I mean, just to clarify, I, I think that's not board decision making about museums is not the board's role. That's why we have executives and are training the future. Um, it's this oversight, but it sets an imp a critical tone. I think that repre being representative of the museum to create trust in many communities is clear. Obviously, hiring the right leadership is the number one job that the board has, and so you have to ask that question. If they don't share the values and have the complex life experiences and there isn't enough you know, diversity of life experience, not just everything else, how would you select the next leader, since we're talking about the next generation of leadership? So uh, I think there's an important role, but again, this thing is it's up to us, and this group has, we do have the power. Like I always say this to my staff, we, we can make the museum anything we want. I mean, we have to pay for it. But, you know, we can make it whatever we want. And I think that's an empowering idea that we all have to make it what we want. And I think, I mean, I, I look at it totally optimistically. 
we can make it whatever we want if, as long as we can you know, make that work. And that's why the collective, the collaborative, the buy-in, and I think the board has to sort of be reflective of that. And so I think you, what you don't want is the opposite disjunction too, which is you have a board thinking one way, and then you've got <laughs> the whole staff thinking another way. That's not good either. So it's about finding that beautiful echo so there's a holism to it. If that makes sense, but but uh, the power's with us, and I think that's why the responsibility's with us who work at museums to. Execute. Yeah, the the board is technically to give um, fiscal and governance oversight and make sure the institution's adhering to its mission, and a good board does that. Some some yeah, boards some boards don't, some and boards they overstep their. The details, but that's another <laughs> yeah, conversation to. Yeah. There's a question here. How does one apply for that fellowship, and is there an age limit, first of all? <laughs> <laughs> and um, before they do fellowship, can they, can they work for museum as um, raising funds or as this, um, you know, assistant curator? Um, well, the fellowship itself, the ASU LACMA fellowship, is designed for people, as Deborah said, who already work at museums, because often you get to a museum and you don't have the resources for school, it's expensive, and also you'd have to leave your job, and they're hard jobs to get. So the idea was could we combine the work study? Um, the, f the focus of that is to create the next generation of leadership, not just directors, but uh, <laughs> cur curatorial leaders. But we did, one of the interesting thing is art history that thinks this way and art criticism and all the things that get studied at ASU are, are fundamental to the ideas behind everything, including fundraising, right? So if we had more of those ideas embedded in fundraising, so we're not exclusive. Matthew, you were working in the store, right? Or, and Celia's in development, and Deandra was a traditional curator, so um, it's open to all that. And so I don't think there's an age limit, but you have to have worked at the museum for a few years and be in that situation, right? Steve? How do we apply? Uh, people within, we do, um, are we within each museum, and Franklin does this too for less, and Mickey, and now we have the, do we have somebody at the herd already? Do we have, we have, people in already, yeah. So we, um, yeah, there, people apply, and the standards are ASU standards. Yeah, and they're selected. It's competitive, and, um, and there are currently some scholarships available, and we're trying to raise money for endless scholarships, right? <laughs> so. One more question. Oh, right here in the front row. So there's been a lot of conversation about what the definition of a museum is, and I would love to know from the fellows and, and graduates um, how you would like to redefine what a museum is. We're all taking notes. <laughs> I mean, I, it's hard because museums are a place of observation, collecting, indexing, control. I feel like it's really, art museums can do something more expansive and I think that I'm leaning into that expansion. So where do I find community? Maybe in a food court, in a gay bar. <laughs> can the museum be, can City Barnett's like Eagle Creek Saloon be transformed the museum into a vital space where we're honoring all the people who have opened up and closed bars around the city? Um, can we hire DJs who, um, you know, have gone on to become historical artists but have no archival memory and we're forgetting them? Um, so they're places of mourning and remembrance and I think that, um, I think that museums can lean on this idea of being a civic space, um, but the, civ the civility needs to come from, uh, from the periphery, from places where you find pleasure, joy, desire. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, to add on to Matt's um, idea that a museum should be a civic space, I think it really just depends on the community in which the museum lives within that, that type of ecosystem, right? So um, just being really responsive to the needs of the audiences that it's serving and understanding its audiences and continuing that and being stewards of the cultures that it touches. Um, and so that is a different definition for every single museum in a different community. So I can't say what a museum is definitively, but in principle, that's what my vision of a museum is. And then just suturing ideas together. Um, I suppose the, the model of, of most uh, encyclopedic museums specifically derives from the 17th century Kuskamer <laughs> cabinet closet, um, looted objects from around the world. Um, and any way that we can push against that, we need to. And in this sense, then I think museums can be, have the potential to be sites for not only experimentation, but, and risk taking, but also resistance, um, statement making, important arenas, safe arenas, um, to make the kinds of statements that change culture and um, affect who we are and how we think about ourselves. I think that's a great final word to close on. Um, please join me in thanking the panel tonight. Thank you, Franklin, on Zoom. Thank you, Deborah. And, and I want you, to um, welcome you all. To, we're going to have a reception right here, um, right here in the space. And please stay, and we can continue speaking to one another more casually off the stage. Thank you for coming. <laughs>